thing. So we have reached the final part of our course. There are still so many things that I would like to tell you, but uh, this is part 727b of our course on mathematical methods of signal processing. And what I would like to do is a little bit come back uh, to the questions that I have raised at the beginning and during the course. I'm quite sure that I will add a few more terms, kind of I have a whole collection of things which are done in engineering books in a way that I would not accept as a, you can say, pedantic mathematicians, but which I would like to fix. Uh, so I would not say, well, you're wrong and you should do it in the abstract way. No, I think I should provide the tools so that these heuristic arguments are meaningful. So, um, of course, I cannot answer all these questions. And sometimes you cannot save a kind of a bad argument. I would like to replace it by a good argument. Uh, in my lecture notes, I think I put somewhere the example of Canval, uh, where he's saying, well, it's not true that the value of the Dirac function, wrong wording, at zero must be uh, zero. It must be plus infinity, it can be minus infinity. And what he does then is pr promoting an example where he takes two or oh, three bump functions, two positive a little bit aside, plus a one negative. And then he's compressing, and I would say applying the stereo operator to this function, which has three bumps, but with total integral plus one. Okay, clearly in his case, the value of this Dirac sequence 10 to minus infinity, and uh, it's still at the limit, the Dirac. You could also ask, why is the Dirac measure not having a shape? We could have a rectangular Dirac, a Gaussian Dirac, a triangular one or so. Well, at the end, if we compress everything, the action doesn't see, it just sees the value of the integral of all these functions if you only compress one function or all these areas have to, you can take Dirac sequences with different functions at each moment, make them more and more narrow, choose a new shape. They will also converge in the weak star to the delta. But the correct statement is uh, that, and let, maybe we go to, to this uh, point here. The Dirac is not a function and um, pointwise values are not good. I see there's a typo here but it's a functional and a bounded measure with bounded measure norm, I have to correct this. And it has a support and to say it's zero everywhere means it has trivial actions everywhere away from zero. So you give me some number which is different from zero and I would say, okay, the distance to, to any point, uh, 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 let's say you give me a point set, different from zero, it has a distance, absolute value of set. So if you take functions which are supported on an interval or a ball of or around set with half the radius, all the functions vanish at, at zero. So they will be annihilated by our functional f goes to f at zero. So I'm writing delta for delta at zero here, of course. So the, the claim, the correct claim, instead of saying the function values are zero, it's the action is zero everywhere except at zero. And that's just the statement um, that the support of a delta now in a general position is just the support of a shifted delta at zero. And that's just the shift of the original support, which is x plus zero, which is x. Now the fact that it's uh, integration is just saying that something where you have to learn to distinguish between symbolic integrals and real integrals. And for me nowadays, it's the same as symbolic inverse of three over four fun. Real inverse of three over four is four over three. Pi over square root of two, the symbolic inverse is uh, uh, well, what did I say? Square inverse of square root of two divided by pi is pi divided by square root of two. Well, what does it mean? Well, pi has an inverse, square root of two has an inverse, and we have rules, so we use the symbol symbols for this infinitesimal expression, which have nothing to do with the rational approximation. And so we are seeing here 
the symbolic integral and apply the delta functional. Uh, if it was an ordinary function, we would say k of t dt. Now it's a new symbol. We write delta of t dt. If it's a measure, people would write it's a, saying it's an integral with respect to a measure. But I would say, no, we apply this signal, this functional delta to a constant one. You don't see constant one because you don't have to write it one times delta or so. So to say that the delta is uh, a distribution which is supported at zero and applied to constant one uh, is giving you one is a very reasonable thing. Why? Because if you change the function and you modify it outside of the support, any function which has the value one at origin is getting one. Every function in C0, which has value seven at zero has given you seven because it's linear, everything is linear. So it's really just the action, this measurement of a function by taking the value at zero, which is meaningful of, on all of the bounded continuous functions. And of course, this is kind of the interpretation. So we have something which works very much like the um, this heuristic definition, but it's now a serious thing. Now, another thing that I wanted to mention, which is related to the discussion that we had before, if you're, um, well, how, so yeah, in a way, how can we get from the Fourier series theory to the Fourier transform theory? So um, there are two reasons why people are, are using this argument very often. The first one is the historical reason. So if you want to look up some details, uh, I have given this talk on Fourier analysis in 21st century, uh, so a while ago, it's in my talk collection or so. But uh, the original one is almost 200 years ago. It was the development of Fourier series, which at the beginning of the 20th century turned into Oh yes, we should think of L2 on the torus. That's the space where these um, integrable, uh, these square integrable uh, functions live. And we should take this as an abstract Hilbert space. And then we work with the pure frequencies in the same way as we work with the three-dimensional space with an orthonormal basis. Well, you can even think of the unit vectors. So what are the contributions of each unit vector you just project your, your vector onto these directions. And that's essentially the Fourier series. Well, it's true there is a problem coming in because we have infinitely many. And there's a problem because the convergent is only in the square mean, so in the, in the sense of the L2 norm. But uh, uh, these problems can be overcome either by restricting your attention to subspaces like the L1 coefficients or the absolutely convergent Fourier series or so. Okay, so we know at that time of history well, quite well what the Fourier transform is. Now let's go to the func to functions on the real line. At that time, there was nothing like a CD player or a digital ra uh, radio or so. So cutting a function into pieces would have been possible technically at that time as well. So to extend the Fourier transform by cutting a function into pieces. But at that time, people were thinking, well, we make the period longer and longer. And uh, so uh, I just want to mention this in the notes. You will find a, a few notes that I didn't discuss. You're saying, well, what does it mean make the period longer and longer? Start with a function which has compact support, maybe living in the interval minus three to plus three. Well, normally people would say we do a Fourier series expansions by thinking it's a periodic function, maybe a length uh, four pi or so. Uh, but uh, then you can say it's also periodic with risk. We can view it as a function which is periodic with periodic 300 or 20,000 or so. And if you look what the Fourier coefficients mean there in real world coordinates, they're more and more refined. We would say, it's weak star convergent to the true original function now evaluated at all the points. And you will look at the Fourier transform and that's really the ordinary continuous Fourier transform. What I also don't like is when you look at these things, uh, at the derivations, these heuristic derivations of the forward and the inverse Fourier transform that you have with the integral, then you're, you're seeing often the argument 
forward and inverse Fourier transform are, are really inverse to each other in the sense of mappings. Therefore, in the limit, the same can be expected. Now, I would agree that you can expect it, but I would not agree is that this is a proof of any kind or so. So you really have to sit down and prove it. I mean, at the end of the course, I could say, let's prove it for a zero. So let's prove it for the Gauss function. Let's prove it for time frequency ver shifted versions of the Gauss functions. Okay, no problem um, because of the invariance properties. Let's take infinite sums. Oh, we get all of a zero. So that's one of the characterizations of a zero, which I did not prove in detail, but I should mention it. A zero can be also written as the collection of all absolutely convergent sums of time frequency shifted Gaussians or any other element of a zero. Or as we have done it, we do the proof of the forward and the Fourier, for, uh, inverse Fourier transform uh, for L1 intersected the Fourier algebra. Here we are in a subspace of continuous functions. So you're saying all the continuous functions which are Lebesgue integrable, but then they are also Riemann integrable in this case. And then you are uh, proving it and it was the consequence of the fundamental relationship which also allowed us to prove the Plosschreil theorem. So you have to prove it and then you can use it and then you can say it was a good heuristic so we are not surprised. But we had a much, other, much different way of doing it. We were just saying, well, if the space is invariant, we can uh, write a set in this way. Now, this really means that we are doing an adjoint action. So we'd say, we should say the adjoint of the free transform operator as an operator on the test function is what you get, what you do on your functional by applying the functional to the action of the free operator on the underlying space of test functions. So formally this sigma head to the left is the joint action of the free transform. But because of the nice properties of the operator, you would say that you're just extending it uh, and, and the verification that it's really an extension is again, the fundamental relationship of the free transform or so. So you would say that you should take uh, the transpose matrix, but we have seen in the continuous setting, the kernel the, in the sense of operator kernel of the free transform is the function um, of two variables of x and uh, well, let's say t and s, which is which we have written as e to the two pi i s t or t s. And that's the great thing. If you transpose it, you're changing the order of s and t, but s times t is the same. If you do it in one dimension, it's really s times t. If you do it in two dimensions, it's just the scalar product. But even the scalar product doesn't depend on the order because it's the scalar product of the real vector system, the coordinate system. Okay, so we have forward Fourier transform. We also have seen that the inverse Fourier transform can be done by saying inverse Fourier transform of sigma applied to F is sigma of the inverse Fourier transform. So there's no problem. So we also have seen that already for bounded measures, we have that the Dirac of course is giving you as a Fourier transform uh, the constant one. And therefore it's clear that the inverse Fourier transform of constant one, which is a very harmless mild distribution must be the zero. I have to correct must be Delta at zero. So how would you write it? And now I'm saying as a psychological integral with invisible one, I really wrote it invisible here. So it's some integral where you say inverse Fourier transform of any ordinary function is such an integral times the inverse Fourier transform is the Fourier synthesis. So you're saying I'm taking so much of the e to the pi i, well, I take one times this and I integrate over all the values, now all the frequencies s and I get delta zero. So uh, of course, uh, this is uh, no problem and is a correct interpretation or so. So for me, it's a good way to say, well, when I see this claim, it's not stupid, it's not wrong. 
but I have to distinguish it as a symbolic procedure. It's a, a symbol for saying the inverse Fourier transform. I also want to mention that it's a very natural and plausible argument uh, that you might want to take it. Well, I probably should put a DS here. You could say, well, if I do it pointwise, there is a kind of argument for um, T different from zero. So you try to write delta zero of T and to compute it now as a function of T, and then this is oscillatory. So if you take big integrals, maybe you integrate from minus 20 pi to plus 20 pi or so, then you always have full cycles or it depends a little bit, but in some very reasonable way, you could say it is zero, kind of zero everywhere. But if you put zero, then all to the e to the two pi i, it should be a, a, a i here, but i times zero is also zero. So you're getting the integral here is just zero. i is just constant one. And everybody would agree that integrating constant one over the whole real line is plus infinity. So that sounds so nice that I integrate, I get pointwise the value zero in a way, and I get plus infinity, so it must be the Dirac. And then my usual uh, comment is, and why is it not uh, three? Because three times infinity would be also three or so. So these pointwise considerations are not a good idea. Now, the next thing that I would like to address, uh, which you can uh, kind of look at now is, what about the sifting property of the Dirac delta? So it is used as an argument for the proof of the uh, representation of a translation invariant linear system and by analogy with the discrete case. So it's true if you are doing the discrete non-periodic case, for example, then every input signal, you're assuming that your test signal, you're testing your system, your discrete system by a finite input vector, is just a finite linear combination of, of unit vectors, so of, of unit vectors maybe uh, yeah, sitting at the integer lattice, let's say. Now, the point is that all these unit vectors are shifted versions of the unit vector at zero. So instead of delta at zero, we have just a unit vector. And it looks that we can put every signal and we use, if we know the output of our system, if it's linear and invariant at, uh, for the unit vector at zero, we can know what the output is for the unit vector at five, because we just take the output, so what we call the impulse response shifted by five, and if you have a linear combination of the unit vectors with certain amplitudes, you're doing the same linear combination afterwards. So it becomes a discrete convolution operator. Now we have a collection of unit vectors, but the funny thing or the bad thing is they are not in our function space anymore. Uh, actually, there is no reasonable function space except you're starting to allow distributions. So if you would think of this I would again call it a almost symbolic interpretation. And we've seen that you can do convolution in many different ways. But then you would say, well, what I'm doing here, and um, at some point I saw a discussion of somebody saying that, why uh, are you allowed to put, instead of T minus X, you can, could put delta of X minus T? Well, because obviously the flip operator is uh, invariant, I mean, the delta at zero is invariant on the flip operator. Why this? Well, the flip operator on the measure is just natural continuation of the flip operator of an ordinary function. So either you're saying, well, I approximate my Dirac with a, with a collection of, collect of Gauss functions or rectangular functions, and if I flip them, they're staying unchanged. Or you're saying, no, flip of delta on the function f is delta of the function f flipped. But delta of f flipped is a flipped version of f at zero, which is f of minus zero. And everybody knows f of minus zero is zero. So that's no problem. Okay, let's come back to this. So this, uh, I would say, looks to me that this the reasonable interpretation like a convolution operator. We have seen that the interpretation of this right-hand side is just saying, well, if you're convolving f with delta x, you get a shift. Well, if you're convolving with delta zero, you're shifting by zero. So this 
complicated expression is just saying that the identity operator applied to f. If you're asking what is the value at t, you just take the value of the function f at t, because the value at t is delta t of, of uh, applied to f, and delta t is moving the evaluation mapping uh, to delta zero to the position t. We have seen that's the same as taking the le the opposite translate. So we would say no, no. We are taking the function, shifting it backwards, and evaluating the shifted version at zero. But this is all kind of trivial. I mean, to derive anything strong and reasonable from it is is kind of not very plausible. So what we are, what I would claim is the shifting property is praised so much as a important and fundamental property of the Dirac delta or so. It's just making things um, artificially uh, kind of complicated to answer it with symbolic uh, expressions. And uh, so I'm, I, I'm not so happy about this. Uh, I think uh, that's, yeah, I think that's where I, I was stopping to, to do my, my uh, discussion. And uh, I would like to check this yeah okay there's one more thing um, that would be kind of the section of what we have not done i would like to go through a few uh, comments so we have not done multi or well let's say we have done multi-dimensional signal processing in almost all the abstract versions so if you look at the beginning characterization of invariant systems that has been written down uh, in the d-dimensional setting. Actually, almost everything I have been doing has been uh, formulated in a way that would allow to generalize it to locally compact abelian groups. Um, actually, the presentation of the material in this course was a little bit more uh, like uh, saying we are in the Euclidean setting a little bit better off. We have a special thing, namely the Gauss function, and we have a special way of the, the getting direct sequences by compression and of stretching. So the use of the Gauss function, which was crucial at the one point, the normalization for the inverse Fourier transform, I was using it at the very end, and the use of Dirac sequences and approximate units in the free algebra by using a compressed and a dilated version of the Gauss function is something that you cannot do on general groups where you have to work in a more cumbersome way. That's why I think it is reasonable to work in this way. So what is uh, happening in the 2D setting? You would have local plane wave representations of an image. And so the plane waves are really patterns which are very much like a zebra. And I will just show you one little thing in the, in the MATLAB code. So this was our test images, test image. Stefan Paukner had a nice, PH, uh, yeah, nice PhD thesis where he, I was uh, doing all this. Uh, uh, no, I think it was a master thesis where he was doing all this. Um, and uh, you can look up uh, this. So there are applications to signal processing. Um, yeah, I think uh, these things are all I wanted to show you. Maybe uh, so we have now seen that there is a big world of uh, mild distributions that allows us to treat periodic functions questions of approximation of discrete by continuous and all these things. And uh, so the remaining uh, half hour or so, I will at most, I will try to show you a few more things, but you should feel free to contact me and I'm probably continuing with a few things which are not known so well or which are written in some of my papers. So the first thing that I uh, would like to re recall is uh, this uh, uh, part here. Oh, it's too, I just have to be careful. Um, it's uh, this, I will, will like to show you the situation with, uh, oh, this I have done already, with the BGG. 
So I have shown you, it's not good because it's, maybe I put it inside. Yeah. Yeah. So this is better. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the first thing is um, a little bit background information about the Bupus. So I have, uh, I'm using now for a long time, a routine which is called Bupus Pline. Uh, maybe I'm also doing it now. My MATLAB has work, works now better. So I'm writing uh, Boop and, oops. Hope it works. And poop is poop spline and an A. That will be by default uh, uh, the cubic spline, which means I'm doing a convolution of a rectangular function four times. So I'm smoothing three times the original partition of unity uh, and uh, uh, it's a collection of row vectors. Therefore, in order to get the correct plot, I have to put a transpose of it and I'm running it. Before I want to tell you, my routine low boop signal is just saying, well, what I'm doing is I'm taking a band limited function, which means I'm randomly generating complex Fourier coefficients in a certain range. That's the frequency number here. And then I'm saying I'm taking from a boop pool, those parts of these band limited functions which are centered up to some point. So if I would change the parameters, uh, the first and the second parameter of my low boop signal routine, I would get lower signals or more or less smooth signals. But now I would like to run it so that you can also see, uh, you see I'm getting a new function, I'm getting this partition of unity and um, uh, this is so surprising. Yeah, maybe I should do that once more. No, no, uh, I see. Uh, we're getting a spectrogram. I don't have to discuss this here. Um, so the next thing that I would like to, to tell you is that uh, what happens if, yeah, this, the next thing is a short illustration of a theorem which I was proving and I was calling it the piano reconstruction theorem or so. So what we have seen so far is that the Garbo coefficients are not at all uniquely determined. In a linear algebra way, we would say, you're coming with a signal in a 480 dimensional space. And you're allowing me to compute anything in of, of the 720 dimensional space. Now, if the frame operator is invertible, as we were assuming, then um, we can represent every signal in this way. But uh, the null space of the synthesis mapping has to be 720 minus 480, which is 250, uh, 240 dimensional. So if the redundancy is three over two, the null space for the synthesis mapping has to be redundancy minus one, which in our case is 150% minus 100% is 50%. It's one half of 480. So there's no chance to recover the coefficients. If I compose with a synthesizer, a piece of music, um, and you are doing analysis, you cannot come back to me. I remember a story where a, electronic musician were saying, I have put together short milliseconds from, uh, from sound, and but the ear cannot hear it. And I told him, no, no, even the computer cannot analyze it because if the pieces are too short, what, what does it mean to have 20 samples and to do a frequency analysis of those 20 samples? They don't have a frequency. We need a certain number of oscillations. Okay, but there's the other story that Mozart went into the 16 in chapel. They were singing a choir which was so secret that nobody was allowed to see the score. But Mozart was listening. Of course, he's a good musician. But in this point, I would say it doesn't have to be a genius. If I would 
be able to have the recording, we would be able to transpose this because they were singing in clear frequencies. They are not in a continuous way and they are singing in a, in a, a chord or so. So if I would have a recording of a piano player, jazz, old jazz recording, I would like to be able to recover it. And what is the information that I would use? Hopefully, or the, the piano would be kind of tuned and the timing would be separated. So what if I do Gauber synthesis now with a small, well-separated building block? So the spectrogram would be like this. So there are separations. And then I would say clearly there are some peaks. This is really a random vector, positive coefficients or so. But I would say, well, if I take the spectrogram, the value here is maybe 0.8. So I would identify the lattice, or either, either I know already, or identify the lattice where I assume there will be non-zero coefficients. Why shouldn't it be possible to compute, I don't know, 300 Gabor coefficients for somebody who is giving me 300 Gaussian atoms sitting at locations which I know. And the piano reconstruction theorem is really just a mathematical game. I would say I'm describing the condition that allowed to say, well, first by looking at the uh, spectrogram, guessing by the amplitudes of this collection of shifted bump functions, what would, could be the coefficient and then say, well, this is my first approximation. So there was 0.8 here, I take this as a coefficient. There was 0.9 here, there was 0.2 here and so on. So I'm writing these coefficients. Now, if my VGG is well enough concentrated so that uh, this test would apply, I would get a linear independent family and actually the reconstruction would be quite easy. I would just say, take those coefficients and make a new signal. I make the spectrogram of the new signal. And that, of course, will not have the exact values because there are overlapping from the left and right and upper and lower neighbors or so. But if I iterate, I would say, well, I have already the, the knowledge of the exact samples of my spectrogram at these values. My first approximation is not perfect, but it is reducing the error from, well, let's say, 100%, I'm starting with zero, to 90%. If I can prove that I'm gaining each time an improvement of a factor 0.9 by doing sufficiently many iterations, I would have an almost perfect reconstruction or so. So this would be something I have also prepared a code for B-spline interpolation. So how can I get an interpolating B-spline? Well, I take my spline function. I'm saying, well, that's the first approximation, but of course for cubic splines, it's not interpolating. So let's do the same trick that I was proposing for the piano reconstruction. And I would, be, uh, that works and it gives you a nice reconstruction. It's not a very fast algorithm, but it's a possible algorithm. Okay, so what, what you can see here is that if you're taking a sufficiently uh, sparse family of Garber atoms, then you are having a, actually a linear independent set you can form a biorthogonal family. So here, I'm just doing this here. I'm just saying the VGG is in my code now. The, so I call it VGG30 is the sampling of a lattice. And uh, clearly this is now a lattice where the redundancy is, uh, is not appropriate. So it's a very sparse lattice. It's, it's, it's what you would expect your lambda zero as a suitable or so. And now I'm computing the sum over all the coefficients and they're getting the value 1.2215 in this case. And I, as I was telling you in the theoretical part, one is coming from the zero entry. So if the total sum is clearly far away from two, all the other ones are just 20. 0.22, so less than a quarter of the identity operator. So this of course means that in this case, uh, we have a linear independent family of those coarse time frequency shifts, or if we would do it with, with a Gabor system, you would have a full, uh, you would have a nice Gabor frame, but and now um, the every matrix as we were discussing it has several different representation. The standard representation is as a matrix. 
we can take this as an, a discrete version of the kernel of the operator. So it's just a matrix describing it acting on rows or columns. You can change the basis to the free basis. Now, if it's a projection onto the Garber atoms, so it's G, I mean, I could write it as G column vector with G row vector. Then it turns out that the Gauss, the discrete Gauss is made fully invariant, therefore this and this has to be the same. Uh, the spreading function has to do something with the BGG as we have seen. Eta of a projection is, is uh, BGG. Now what is VGG? VGG is the correlation of G with the time frequency shifted Gauss function. So if I'm only interested in the section here in the horizontal, I'm asking what is the scalar product between a function, Gauss function and a shifted Gauss function? Oh, this is just a convolution of the Gauss by itself. So this profile has to be a convolution square, which is of course a broader Gaussian, the area is one, and um, so it's exactly a dilation a stretching. So it's ST rho, uh, but with rho equals square root of two. So you make it broader. Now it's not completely trivial that it's really the absolute value is radius symmetric. So it's really a broader Gauss function. And even more surprising is it's definitely not a broader Gaussian, but the absolute value is here. It's coming with phase factors because otherwise you could not explain that taking the inverse symplectic Fourier transform, which is the same as the forward symplectic Fourier transform, is bringing you to this Kohn-Nierenberg symbol. Now, if you see these pictures, you are tempted to say, well, maybe the Kohn-Nierenberg symbol is a Gauss function. And it's true, the absolute value of the Kohn-Nierenberg symbol is a Gauss function, but otherwise there are again phase factors. So in this situation, if everything is Gaussian, I mean, really, I mean, the signal is Gaussian, you're projecting on the Gaussian. Also, all these things have a Gaussian shape, but with phase factors, which you don't see here. I was just trying to uh, show you the Kohn-Nierenberg symbol and that it's in having non-trivial distribution of real and imaginary part. So you have this, this procedure or so. Now, uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention uh, in connection with the Sebra is um, that uh, the two-dimensional plane, um, yeah, the two-dimensional Q frequencies are the plane waves. So you could create such a plane wave in a very easy way. Actually, for every orthogonal expansion, you could say, well, if you have a routine which is forward and inverse Fourier transform or any like, I don't know, Wilson basis or so, you get the building blocks by just saying, well, a building block is something which in the coefficient domain, in the transform domain is a unit vector. So create a unit vector. So create an N by N matrix, put a one at any place. Maybe we can do it. Yeah, I shouldn't start improvising. And then uh, take the inverse free transform. So you will see a plane wave, which is something like this, but covering the whole picture. Clearly every plane wave has two features, which is a direction and, an, and a frequency. So the ripples are oriented in some way and they have a frequency. Now, low frequency should mean the unit vector should sit near zero. So if they have zero, and we know in MATLAB we have no zero coordinate. So if you take a pixel image, a harmless pixel image, you put a one in the left upper corner at the MATLAB coordinates so one, one, and you go back, you get the average of this DC component. So if you take a gray level image, very often the FFT two dimensional will have a very big component there because a gray level image has a peak, which is incredible and destroying the whole structure. So when you want to look at the spectrum in the ordinary sense of a, of a two-dimensional Fourier transform, remove this part and put it to zero and then look at the rest. Okay, now the story is that the plane waves are actually actually just the tensor product of plane for pure frequencies in the time and in the, and in the x and the y direction. And so because Gauss functions also can be used as tensors, so you just have to take 
the Gauss family, and you see I'm just taking G2 is a Gauss function. I'm doing uh, some, um, yeah, some time frequency shift. So I'm moving it to some place. And then I'm taking from these, the, the tensor product. So you see here, I'm product of the two, one in this direction, one in this direction. And of course, the absolute value would be one. So I have to take the real part of, of this and I was moving it to the center so that you can see it better or so. So this is one of the building blocks. Now, slight disadvantage of these building blocks and Garber expansion is that they are have to be redundant. Well, if you would do the reconstruction of an image from its full short time free transform, you would have to create a four dimensional tensor or you think of a in MATLAB, it would be matrix a matrix of matrices and so on, and uh, labeled with four coordinates, but it would be huge. If you have a pixel image with just 10,000 uh, pixels, you would have to think of 10,000 squared voxels, and that's not reasonable. So the ability to have decent Gabor families with redundancy less than two would be uh, quite important, which we can do. And then you have building blocks organized in this way. What is the difference to JPEG? Well, JPEG would say, we take the boxcar function, we are taking eight pixels to the left here, and we are decomposing it into an autonomous system. And what is the disadvantage of doing image compression? We're using the JPEG, while the box number one doesn't know anything in box number two. So the transition from one box to the other is not good. And if you do high compression with JPEG, you are having a Gabor system in a way, but you are not using it uh, in the nice way. So kind of it's clearly not as zero, I would say. So if you do this, uh, you can do it with 2D Gabor and uh, uh, you would get a, a good signal. So maybe let me see. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just demonstrating a naive way, but still not so bad nowadays because computers are getting faster and faster, how you would be able to create a two-dimensional Gabor transform of an image. So just in order to have to show something, I'm doing a low pass signal of format n times n with maximal frequency eight in the x direction and 10 in the frequency direction or so. If you do this quite differently, you will see an orientation or so. So you see here that picture. So what is now doing a Gabor transform? Now we have to recall what does it mean to do a two-dimensional free transform. We have seen it is doing row-wise, column-wise. So what are we doing uh, here? Where and how are we doing it? We are doing it by matrix multiplication. I was saying take the matrix representing the Gabor, and we are doing it to understand what's going on, we're multiplying from the left and from the right. The left action works on the columns, the right action works on the rows. Matrix multiplication or the FFT2 on such an image would be a triple product, but we know it's associative, so you can choose the order, you get always the same. Now, what I would do here or what I do here in the concrete case, I would say we have to multiply now with the Gabor system. So of course I was choosing a picture, a so-called picture of size 480 times 480. So I can use my Gabor family that just do it in a naive way. Of course, uh, Stefan Paukner was implementing it more efficiently, but here we are having small dimensions. We have a dual Gabor atom, a dual Gabor family and our Gabor family. So taking Gabor coefficients means row wise and column wise so the left one would take it column wise. Once we have done this, you could put brackets here. You get the 400, uh, no, a 720 by 480 matrix. Then you multiply it with G prime. And what you see is the Gabor picture or G pick G is left and right multiplied with G, of course, in the right format, I get a 720 by 720 matrix. Uh, now uh, I was inserting something uh, here, so maybe I should uh, try to show you only that it's really doing a reconstruction. So, and then maybe I have to stop here. My original picture should be recovered, of course, by multiplying with GD from the left. 
uh, the G pick G and with the GD from the right. Hope that I'm uh, getting a good result now. So, uh, okay, their name was different. No, I have probably the, the object not in the in the right way and then not in the storage. Yeah. And so I'm going here and I'm doing it. And you see it's up to numerical precision. Uh, so, and also you see it's quite fast, so there's no problem. So what would it mean to apply uh, to the, uh, now a Gabor multiplier? I would have to detect and I would have to say, well, I see a picture, maybe it's a portrait. I would like to blur the background in these parts of the things much more, whereas I would like to keep all the information in the center. So what you have to do is to find some uh, factors by which you would multiply those coefficients in this 720 by 720 matrix that you would like to eliminate. So, I mean, it is, we are late in our, our recording now, but you could, for example, say, let's find the coefficients which are small in this representation because most likely they are unimportant. So maybe those who are smaller than 10% of the maximal amplitude of our GABA in our GABA domain. You don't have to know or do any bookkeeping. You just do it in pointwise multiplication of this at this 720 by 720 matrix. And then before restoring it, you would multiply with this mask and you would replace peak by peak multiplied with the filter, which is a kind of thresholding, which is analog of similar to the MP3 coding where you would say, I know which one of the frequencies people cannot hear. So let's put them to zero and we're getting a huge compression or so. Of course, in the real world, you would do coding and you would have to write the labels of those entries and not store the full matrix or so. But just to give you an idea, uh, you could do this. And uh, at some occasions we were doing some uh, demos. For example, you could say, I'm taking the Sabra and we are getting a fairly good reconstruction. Uh, and we see that the billing blocks are different in different areas. The important coefficients are important because the pattern of the zebra is uh, clearly different, has different orientation and different uh, uh, importance in different areas. So you have to distinguish between the orientation at a given part of the image, which is related to a Fourier coefficients. And then of course you can ask yourself, what are good Garber systems? Uh, how much redundancy do you need? Uh, can we have efficient code? Can we do the same thing in the continuous setting? And just recently I was doing some experiments with Garber multipliers, just in order to understand some uh, theoretical thing. And it was kind of much easier for me to understand the situation from a discrete MATLAB experiment and then to sit down and uh, check the continuous version. So it's not only an illustration as I was using it where theory is going first, but it's also good for simulations. And yes, I think I hope I have given you a, an overview over the way how I see it. So hopefully also the idea of conceptual harmonic analysis came through, which means we're living in different worlds, but with the banach gelfand triple, we have a way to connect one with the other. And uh, I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much.